Welcome everybody to our fourth busy webinar with the National University of Singapore. I'm Robin Milden. I'm your facilitator for today and I am the Executive Director for the Centre for Evidence and Implementation and a visiting Associate Professor with NUS School of Medicine and the Co-Director of BUSY, the Behavioural and Implementation Science Intervention Centre that we have established um, not that recently now, but we've survived COVID in the last year or so. So we're really pleased you could uh, join us again today. This is our first webinar for 2022, and we have um, a whole bunch of really exciting ones planned. Hopefully, you'll continue to join us. I want to um, uh, encourage you, all participants, to post Q&As. Uh, any questions that you have, sorry, in the Q&A button as we go. I'll be monitoring that as the speakers talk, and um, it makes it more interactive if, if I um, have questions from you that I can select and, and throw at them. So it is my absolute pleasure to introduce our two panellists today, Associate Professor Joanne New, who has got the longest bio that I've ever read, which means I'm, I'm hardly going to do her justice, other than she's currently Associate Professor at NTU in the School of Medicine. She's also a Senior Consultant in the Division of Medical Oncology at the National Cancer Centre in Singapore. I am also um, very pleased to, to let you know that she uh, studied at the University of Melbourne as well, which is where I am coming to you from. So Joanne and I have a few things in common. It is also my great pleasure to introduce Dr. David Chambers, who is the Deputy Director for Implementation Science in the Office of the Director in the Division of Cancer Control and Population Science Sciences at the National Cancer Institute. That is the longest title anybody has ever been, had ever been provided with. I have been lucky enough to know David for some time now and can um, honestly say he has made quite the difference in implementation science and healthcare, both in the US where he works now and globally. And we are very grateful to have you here, David, and grateful, Joanne, to have you as well. And um, really looking forward to seeing, to hearing what you've got up your sleeve. So each of the speakers will speak for about 10 minutes each, and then we will quickly move into Q&A and or following up on what they were discussing. So Joanne, I wouldn't I would love to hear from you a little bit about your experience. What experience have you had that's been the most striking in terms of the recent use of behavioral and implementation science in health and healthcare systems? If you could tell us a little bit about that. So again, thank you very much, Robin, as well as the busy team for putting this together. It's always a pleasure. I said yes, because it's always good to talk about how we use evidence in medicine. And I think uh, we don't talk about it enough. And so that's one of the reasons why I'm really glad that this seminar series is around. So from my personal experience, I'll say that I trained in medical oncology, um, but I was quite dissatisfied um, with the practice of medical oncology, partly because we were seeing patients in stage four cancers and, you know, we weren't really intervening um, early enough and it was costing the health systems quite a lot of money to manage this group of patients. So I went on to do my fellowship in genomics and the idea was to implement genomics in the clinic. Um, and so I guess my experience with this, and I, again, I'm not an implementation scientist as I told both David and Robin, I'm an accidental one because it's just purely because um, we've had to um, provide evidence to policymakers, to clinicians, to convince them to use 
uh, genomics in the clinic. And, and it's been that journey that's been guiding it. And I think what's most striking to me is that um, in genomics, one of the biggest challenge and missed opportunity really is that um, we make genomics out to sound so complex, right? We make it out to sound like it's this very difficult, lots of uncertainties, very hard to understand kind of thing. And then if you take a behavioral lens to this, um, I, I think that's one framework that I really like, which is, uh, I think it's called EAST. It's like easy, it has to be easy, it's to be attractive, it's to be social, it's to be timely. And with genomics, we've not really messaged it that way. And so I would say that um, we, we've been trying, we're trying. And I think most strikingly is if we keep reminding ourselves, if we can do that, then people, the adoption will become faster. And we have to make it easy on our um, policy makers as well. So I think one of the most important work, and I say this, I do lots of papers on different things, but my most effective uh, paper that I've done that has made an iota of change has been a paper that looked at the fact that if we gave subsidies to everybody for genetic testing, what number would it be that for family members to come for testing that would um, change policy? And that number is 30%. So now I, we quantified it. We were able to give a number to it. And now we work towards reaching that number. And the policymakers actually really like that because I've made it easy for them to assess what would be... Um, kind of net, net cost zero to them for implementing it, for example. Um, and, and so I would say that um, what are my striking lessons? Uh, just easy ones here would be to keep it simple, stupid would be a really good one. Um, and to try and, you know, keep doing that at all levels and to the public, to the patients, to the physician and to the policymakers. So I'm going to stop there and, and, and see where we go from this. Thanks, Robin. Mm, to the point. David, I'm going to pose the same question to you then, just uh, in your experience. Give us an example where behavioral implementation science has been used to really good effect. Uh, sure. Uh, and again, let me echo what Joanne said. It is, an, it is a pleasure uh, to join all of you. It's at the tail end of, of my day, which started with my first in-person talk at a conference in two years. Uh, and here I get to close it with all of you. Oh. So it's a win on all fronts, even though they were sort of 12 hours apart. Um, but just to say that uh, having, having been engaged in uh, behavioral research for a long time, my background academically was in organizational behavior, how we really try and support hospitals, healthcare systems to hopefully do the best thing for the patients, for the families, for the communities uh, that they're intending to serve. And then moving into over the last few decades, really focusing on implementation science, how, again, we make sure that we're in integrating what we know to best effect. Um, I think what's been striking for me over that time period is how we've seen, uh, if you just look at the, the last few decades and, and, and in an area that I'm not uh, directly uh, involved in, but have been able to just watch with wonder, and that's HIV AIDS. And thinking about how we start out with what was likely a death sentence, uh, what was a death sentence for many people a number of decades ago, and through the discoveries, and really then through population level global implementation, we've been able to see in many places, not everywhere, but in many places, where what was an acute and a fatal illness has become a chronic disease that can be managed. The idea that we can move from that uh, initial challenge of, of what could we possibly do for these people who are suffering to be able to say we can get ahead of the curve. We can think about prophylaxis. We can think about prevention. We understand behavior at multiple levels. And we've been able to set targets around trying to make sure that at nine, you know, 90% of, of uh, th those who, who are at high risk can be tested, that those who uh, have uh, HIV can be treated. And that's a combination of implementation at every level. So I feel like that's one, it's outside of the cancer space that I work in, although many of the early uh, HIV AIDS uh, insights came from those who were seeing people suffering from cancer. Um, but just to see the amazing, I, I would say, convergence of great thought, great efforts, not all of them successful, but learning as they go and seeing that from individual level interventions on through policy, we can change behavior in a way that saves millions of lives. 
Well, that was quite a call to action then. Um, David, I'm going to get a follow-up question for you uh, just because I'm aware of a piece that you published that's timely, maybe maybe even with another surge, um, mm. uh, which I think was a contribution where you wrote a very nice piece just as COVID was hitting uh, or um, around how implement, you know, essentially behavioural and implementation science could support our our response to COVID. I just wouldn't mind you extending a couple of points if you can remember the paper that you made in that paper. And then, Joanne, get ready for it because I, I'm also thinking I'd like to sort of understand that at a local level, how the contributions were made. But uh, Sure. So so happy to tee it off. So this was uh, in early, well, it was, yeah, it was, it was early 2020 mm-hmm. when we were recognizing uh, the, the huge uh, impact, the global impact that the coronavirus was going to have. And we started to think through what could we learn? What could we apply as far as what we've already learned about implementation and how we could we do a better job of, uh, of, of seeing our way as a world out of this? And so yeah. it was recognizing that implementation is existing, is occurring all the time, that there's a bunch of different innovations at every level, that people were in many cases putting good faith effort into trying to understand how do we prevent uh, spread of the illness, how do we best treat, how do we think from public health through to health care about the best way to provide a range of services for people, and that we know many of the barriers and facilitators that go into either somebody receiving good care or not, somebody getting good information or not, and it ought to be an opportunity to try and apply all of that to the betterment of our global population. Two years down the road, I think we can see a huge mix Mm -hmm in terms of how well we've done. In many cases, the fast ability to get not only out initial vaccines, but for many people, but not all, boosters, and see the ability to try and uh, raise people's immunity around the world has been a good thing. The rise of misinformation has been an immense challenge, something that we know has been present in our dissemination and implementation studies for a long time, but was spot there was a big spotlight on it over the last couple of years as we've seen the rise of narratives that are not supported by science. And so I think what that piece was trying to get at is we should both apply what we've already learned. We have a lot of frameworks, a lot of models that come into play as we're thinking about what we can do and how do we support those interventions. But then we can learn as we go because we should benefit from the amazing innovations that people are are trying and learn from what hasn't worked very well. So, yeah. Robin, I don't know if that's a helpful. That's good, yep. And I wouldn't, um, if one of the team could throw uh, David's paper up on the chat for the group. Um, and there's several of the busy NCI team on, and I'm sure it's a 2020 paper. Joanne, let's hear a little bit from you also, the thinking from a local context. Was there some contribution that you witnessed or you thought was made in terms of what behavioural or, or implementation science, maybe in particular behavioural science in this case, towards COVID response in Singapore? So I think I, I, I've often joked with my PhD students that people will be doing PhDs on COVID in every field for the next 20 years, right? Because it's just so... I don't think that's very funny. I, that makes me sad. Okay. <laughs> no, but what I, meant, what I meant is there's just so much to dig into in terms of what mm-hmm. lessons COVID has taught us, right? So I think um, what David says is absolutely true, that having the information out there, having setting targets, having awareness, I see that very much locally through the use of, I would say, apps, Mobile apps would be one of the things that has, I think, dramatically changed how we respond to COVID locally, uh, whether it's the use of the fact that uh, WhatsApp messages come through uh, about actual what's happening on the ground, people adjusting behavior based on that, um, things like, um, you know, testing your ART at home. You know, I think a lot of that has, we've made it easy. We've made, we've made it simple for people to do some of these things. So I think those are real positive outcomes from COVID that we should try and sort of leverage off on, um, you know, we, we've shown, right, that by providing the nudges, the, the, the information and the rest of it, people will follow and people will um, pretty much um, um, adapt to the situation um, if they, you know, the way you frame it and the rest of it. And then we, 
I'm excited to see how we use the lessons for cancer prevention, for example, or chronic disease prevention, for example. So I would kind of say those are some of the take homes for myself with regards to COVID, right? Just even things like telehealth, right? Um, Pre-COVID, there was a lot of um, effort to try and get folks to um, take up telehealth. It was slow. It was there were a lot of obstacles, both at the in, at the institution level, policy level, uh, reimbursement level, um, all the way up to like the patient and the public acceptance level. So I think there were all these barriers. But you know, because with COVID, the kind of risk ratio kind of thing got reversed as, as to why people should be having telehealth. It's now just all of that's just happened. 50% of what our consults are now um, increasingly being done through telehealth for, for, for the work I do. So I think that's going to, you know, just make the reach so much bigger, um, enable so many other things to happen by kind of putting medicine really in the community, in the homes. So I kind of feel like um, COVID's really just opened a lot of doors uh, in terms of how we we take the lessons on. Yeah, mm, It's certainly shown us how to implement when we want to, hasn't it? <laughs> it's certainly when we, um, when we put our infrastructure behind us, when we put our behaviour change strategies, when we put our focus on implementation, particularly in Singapore, I would say. Um, yeah. And to reinforce that, I am flying into Singapore on Tuesday. And although there's a lot that I have to do to get in there, it's very easy to follow. Yeah. And it's, and it's definitely shaping my behavior. So it's uh, terrific. I'm going to do a follow-up question and keep the Q&A coming participants because I can see one there um, and here comes a few more. I just want to do a couple of follow-ups with um, Joanne and David and then I'm going to start looking at, at what you're posting. But I really want to know missed opportunity and um, where if we, we could have used behavioral implementation science and possibly it could really have made a difference to healthcare and people's lives. Um, and, Joanne, I'm going to start with you, but I'm going to give David a heads up. David, I also would like to do a follow-up question. I'll give you time to think about, which is um, examples where we have really gone, not done a good job at all around implementation and what has been the consequence of it. I don't think we sometimes talk enough about that, so I'll give you a little bit of time to think. And, Joanne, feel free to go there, but I'll start with you. Okay, Where so are there are many examples, but I think I'm going to go to the, the work I do, right, and, and, and just use that as an example, right? So, for example, the work I do is to look after families with cancers, those with a high-risk genetic predisposition. For example, BRCA1, BRCA2. These individuals get a lifetime risk of 80% of getting breast cancers and other cancers. So you would think you want to intervene in this group and you would think that this you know, this information has been around for 30 years and, and, and across the globe, it's still very patchily sort of applied. And then comes a drug called Olaparib, right? And Olaparib is to treat stage four cancer patients with this mutation. And suddenly you see that the uptake goes up because of the drug, et cetera, et cetera. But from the health systems level, that's really not what's helpful because the patients will have already developed um, cancer and needed the drug, as opposed to if we had tested a lot earlier and then having people go for surveillance and intervene and early detection. So I'm using this as an example of the fact that the, the facts of the, you know, the gene and what it does and all hasn't changed, but the messaging we've missed tremendous opportunities in, you know, in, in how we think about preventative medicine. I mean, I still find it really, I, I, I would say prevention is the, the one area where we've missed trying to emphasize that in, the, in terms that the patients understand and t in terms that uh, patients and public value, uh, because it's really hard to quantify what's the value of doing something um, early ahead of yes. disease, as opposed to there being a drug and the person can say, okay, I can take this drug. So I kind of, um, that that would be for me, a missed opportunity with precision medicine. The overemphasis on the targeted therapy and the lack of emphasis on the preventative side of it. And that, that's an area where I don't think it's going to come from data. It's not going to come from, um, it's going to come from kind of engaging the public and, and, and policymakers in terms of wanting to make that, that shift in, in focus. So, to, 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 I mean, I, I kind of gave that as a very specific example of what mm -hmm. I do. But it's broader than that. It's, it's really the, the, the prevention versus the reactive uh, models of care that we have. Mm. 
Excellent, excellent. That's an ex- terrific example. David, you want to take? Uh, yeah, so so ju- just want to echo actually what Joanne said. I think certainly in a lot of uh, countries and a lot of systems, there's such. Uh, a missed opportunity in recognizing that we can actually uh, preempt or prevent uh, a whole range of different health conditions from arising in the first place. And yet so many of our system incentives are built around treating what is what is already diagnosed and 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 where we have less of an opportunity to really improve trajectories. Um, I, I think in terms of missed opportunities overall, I think until recently, Certainly in in our country and in a number of others, I I would presume we haven't really done a good enough job of recognizing that implementation science should be about implementation for all. And so the idea that for so long we have had inequitable implementation of a lot of our different interventions, that we, even though we know about the range of different facilitators and barriers, the range of different behaviors that will influence whether somebody has access to high quality care, we haven't spent nearly enough time on trying to make sure that the strategies that we've developed to implement our interventions are those that are as compatible as possible with the range of different communities of populations of systems where care is provided. So that's been historic historically a missed opportunity. I think it's been a wonderful sign that in at least recent years in the U.S. and certainly in other places, there's uh, a spotlight shined on health equity and implementation science coming together. That's been a focus of our team at the National mm-hmm. Cancer Institute in the U.S. of trying to make sure that we're recognizing some of those social determinants of health and really determinants around society that will dictate whether somebody has access to care. So that's one. The other one that I'll throw in there is that we've often spent so much of our emphasis on underuse. And so much of this idea that have we got the intervention for you, it simply needs to be added to the heap. And we haven't done nearly as good a job of thinking about where can we create space in the system? What can we de-implement? What can we try and draw down given that our clinicians, our systems, our patients, everybody is overtasked uh, or overtaxed with trying to keep up with all of the things that we suggest folks are doing. And so we haven't created enough space. So de-implementation, I think, is a, has been a missed opportunity, except in rare circumstances, but we could do uh, a lot better there. Well, have I got a nice segue for you. I, um, and just let me, let me echo the uh, what we call pilot on um, implementation approach we have and how difficult that is for systems to take. But there's a nice little question here, sort of related, so I'm going to pose it to both of you. (laughs) Would it be worse to implement an intervention badly early or to delay implementation for a significant time? Joanne. Um, I kind of feel, I kind of think implementation, like with many things, is iterative. I think if the science and the evidence is there for implementation, and if you haven't worked out all the kinks in the system, I think it's okay to run a pilot and to learn on the on on the go. I, and that's how we've been doing, right? And then, you know, obviously, the other thing to sort of say is as much as possible, bring in the other stakeholders that would be involved in that implementation. I think one of the things that I've learned um, over time is I used to, this is really my own kind of journey with this was I used to go, okay, MOH wants this data. So I'm, I'm going to, you know, produce that data or, or, or do that research study and get that data and then engage with them. I think increasingly that's probably not the best. It would be better to engage them before you do the study, bring everyone in. I think some people have called it, uh, you know, a, 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 not a postmortem, but a premortem of 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 things to try and 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 all that. So I would say, um, between the choice of the two, I would still implement early and learn from the process and just keep iterating on it. But maybe keeping it um, keeping it small in the beginning. This is assuming that the science is there and that the evidence is solid. Yeah. 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 David. So I think, uh, and and you'll find the answer to a lot of questions ends up being the it depends that's uh, frequently suggested and and I think fits here, right? So if the intervention has a fair amount of risk when it is used badly for the people who receive it, it is hard to make the case that we're okay with putting our faith in, in poor implementation. At the same time, if there is a sense that even a 
poorly implemented intervention could still have a benefit to those who receive it, then it's hard to make the case that we would delay implementation for that. The other part of the, the, the other side of it, though, really speaks to how good our interventions are. So you can implement a poor intervention incredibly well, and that's not good either. So we really need to be thinking about the fit of the intervention with the circumstances in which it could be used. We need to think about what kinds of supports we're offering to those systems that are trying to uh, use those interventions. And ideally, we need to learn, I think, as Joanna is saying, we need to learn as we go. So it's certainly if we're collecting information on how well we're doing and we can make those kind of iterative adjustments that Joanne was talking about, I think it's easier to say, let's start with what we think might be useful, even if it's not an optimal implementation strategy. But so much depends on what's the uh, hazard of, uh, of using an intervention uh, in the wrong way. Yeah. I guess I will also add that that's also the other challenge we all have, right? Is how do we evaluate once we've implemented, right? And then and also the lack of kind of resources and manpower to actually do that piece of work that, you know, so when I when I'm talking about iterating, you almost have to design it yourself and make sure you're measuring. But if you're not doing that, then that becomes a real concern. And and it's it and it Unfortunately, um, there's so many things that we, we need to implement on and, and there just isn't that amount of resources to really evaluate everything we do. In, in that context, then I would kind of say, then you may want to be a bit more cautious. But yeah, I, I would love to hear David's actually comments on how to increase capacity in terms of evaluating implementations, because I think that's one of the Please struggles. Please go ahead, David. Sorry, sorry, Robin. Because no, no, you, let's it's, go. It's one, I mean, it's, it's the reason why BC was established, right? That's the exactly that we, it. Nice segue. Thank you, Joanne. You're yeah. helping me with my job. David, please. Yeah. So I, so I think one of the things that we first do is we get over this idea that there is a there there should be separate rules for studying things and trying to perform them well in care. And so I think part of it is really looking at what capacity do we already have within our system? What are the metrics for quality that we are convinced are going to need to be present to feel like we're delivering the right kind of care and not make that divorced from this idea of, of how do we uh, understand whether implementation worked or didn't. So part of it is, is, is recognizing that we don't have to build capacity around, as we sometimes do in the scientific world, around the potential to capture anything under the sun with the hope that maybe it will be useful, but really being practical about what are the what are the drivers of care? What are the outcomes that we and our patients and our families actually care about? And can we start with those? That would be the sense because otherwise it becomes this challenging uh, environment where only the few systems that have billions of dollars into their electronic health records and into quality improvement activities that have access to this kind of work. So I think part of it is on capacity for what, but I would say let's let's join the capacity to determine whether we're doing uh, a good job for the patients with that capacity to answering the kind of questions around implementation because they should be one and the same. That is a tweetable, tweetable point. I hope all the um, folks on Twitter are uh, typing fast. Related to that, there's a, uh, I'm watching the questions and, and the, the participants are posing some terrific questions. You might want to have a glance. There's a couple there for you, Joanne, in particular. But I'm going to pose something to both of you first. And it's for, so there's been a bit of a theme around de-implementation. Um, and is there a systematic way to understand when and how to do that? When do you decide something needs to be killed? But um, when do we, just, how long do we try to fix the thing? So it's almost like, how long do we iterate for? How do we decide to de implement if we're de implementing? How do we? So people are looking for some, maybe something from the research or some systematic, is there a systematic way to go about that? David, I'll start with you on that and give Joanne thinking time and then go to Joanne. Uh, sure. So credit to my colleague, Wynne Norton, uh, who has led a few different papers that we've put out recently trying to get people away from this idea that 
de-implementation comes in one flavor. This mm-hmm. idea of we flip off a light switch and all of a sudden no more practice. But really thinking about what is the, you know, starting with what does the evidence say? Does the evidence say that delivering a particular intervention is harmful? Does the evidence say that a particular intervention works for some and in some circumstances and doesn't work for others? Because what that then speaks to is what is the action that we are trying to uh, engage in to solve the problem that that was posed by the evidence or by uh, poor quality. And that problem or that action to be taken could be restricting use to particular populations. It could be reducing a dose of something where the dose ends up being more harmful uh, than than beneficial. It could be replacing something with something else, or it could be removing it entirely. But the point is that we need to have a much more nuanced understanding of what the evidence is saying. What do we know about our interventions as well? We have had a legacy of developing, testing, and rolling out interventions that we don't know as much about as we would like to know in terms of how and why they work. Because of that, it becomes that much more important that we're capturing the evidence on who is benefiting from this and who is not. But I think what we're trying to at least get through, there are systematic approaches to identifying what are those harmful practices, things like choosing wisely, which has a global footprint. Mm -hmm. But in terms of what is it that we want to do when we identify that particular practice, it's a bit more nuanced, but would encourage people to come along for the ride and and actually show us the way. And let me just jump in, Joanne, before you, um, interesting, you brought up choosing wisely, David, because Busy in Singapore is doing a scoping project, just looking at um, any appetite suitability in Singapore, all sorts of stuff. And we're just at, at the early stages. And I think some of the team are on the on this chat. Joanne, please go ahead. Yeah, so I'm, I'm very familiar with Choosing Wisely. And I think it's a great site for folks who, who are interested in this, this area of low value care or care that, you know, we should be de-implementing. The cancer space filled with that tremendous amount of low value um, practices in cancer um, from anything from um, over screening to to overuse of tumor markers to, you know, all, et cetera, et cetera. So how we're tackling this is uh, we are leveraging on EMR data. We are trying to landscape and scope up what's the problem, how big the problem is, and then, and then try and understand where the problem is actually arising. And then, and then trying to intervene more in a more, more targeted fashion um, for that particular behavior, for example, be it um, you know using tumor markers at in primary care for everybody, you know that kind of stuff. So we're we're kind of beginning. We're, I mean, I we know anecdotally this gets done, but we we kind of need that information and then target it that that way. So I would say this whole idea of de-implementation is just like 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 what David says. There's just so much in this area that needs to be done. And really, most of the time, it's a lack of um, uh, funding in this area, I think, to look at the implementation. I think um, I would say from the NMRC perspective, that's increasing focus on this area in health services research. But I'm not quite sure whether um, necess- only until recently that funding increased. But I would say that there's not been enough research uh, dollars put into this area in the past. So I think um, this new um, 2025 research uh, plan is actually much more focused on this value-based care as well as prevention. So we're hoping that we would then get more people involved in this area of work, but um, it's it's kind of overdue and, you know, yeah, in Singapore. Mm. Can, can I add a, a little, I don't know if it's a button on, on this uh, de-implementation topic, but just in reflecting on pulling together behavioral and implementation science for a moment, we know certainly from a lot of work, a lot of study of behavior, that it's really difficult to get people to stop doing something. Mm -hmm. And yet, (laughs) often with de-implementation, there's this idea of we simply say, this is no longer effective, and and magically, again, the world will change. And so applying what this whole center is focusing on, of both de-implementation and behavior, ideally, we can get further. But it's really hard, especially Mm -hmm. when we have systems that are focused on defensive. We need to do as many things as possible. We need to rule out everything. It becomes incredibly hard to say, we're no longer going to do A or B or C. Oh, yeah. Dead. (laughs) Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, we'd all have multiple examples of probably us even advising 
based on some good data and evidence to stop doing something and how difficult that is, particularly in a policy context and in a uh, when there's a lot of government funding. And uh, we could have a whole other webinar on that alone. And I'm sure there'd be a lot of people that would join us. There's a little bit of a theme to go, and I think this applies to de-implementation and implementation, but there's a, a couple of questions that are rolling around the, how do we get people to value the focus on implementation? Um, we see a strong focus on design, uh, in particular, hu human-centered design is popping up um, in a lot of countries we work in for sure, but very poor incorporation of implementation considerations or strategies. So it's sort of, you know, we certainly experience as the, and then you just go do it and it will all be fine. Uh, and so there's, there's a couple of questions around how, how do you, how do you, you know, work with collaborate with policymakers to to uh, improve the focus on implementation? Help people understand that the how can matter just as much as the what. Can they talk to your experience about that, Joanne? You go ahead first, and then David. So I'll say one of the most attractive part of implementation science is when the change actually happens, right? So if you are able to actually affect that change. So I think one of the challenges in terms of me mentoring out to my juniors and having them join to, you know, do some of this work, and it's not as sexy as discovering a new gene or whatever, it's, you know, basically implementing known information, right? Um, it, one of the challenge has been um, if they can't see the product, if they can't see that the work goes towards an actual change that then de-incentivizes de de people being involved, right? So I think, I think if we as a as a community of scientists, academics, together with everyone else who's listening on on your on your on your webinar, um, come together and work in a way where we get we 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 can demonstrate that by doing this work, this has therefore changed we are going to attract more and more people um, doing this. I think it's really just a, that demonstration of that. And I've been successful in a few little projects in my, in my small space. And with that, you know, I've got now one, one of our clinicians wanting to do a PhD, therefore in implementation science. And I think that wouldn't have happened if he hadn't seen um, a, a particular implementation project working. So I, I'm just using that as a very local and simple yeah. example, but I do think on a bigger scale, um, you know, the ministry, the policymakers, everyone working together to make these changes as the evidence comes around, will just bring in more people to do this work, et cetera, et cetera. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I, I agree that I think engagement of, of sort of multiple, of getting people around the table to agree upon what are the outcomes that we're targeting, what is the time frame for those outcomes. I think we've seen that at times the policy timeline or the policy maker's timeline does not line up all that well with when we would expect full implementation to happen and then when we would see the kinds of outcomes that they're looking for. And so I think it is about coming together around a shared understanding of, you know, of what is it that we, um, you know, what, what is it that we're after and what's the pathway to get there. I think that just over the years, We've had such great experience of finding common ground with scientists who are not necessarily focusing on implementation science, with practitioners, with patients, with with um, you know with policymakers. On the science side, it's recognizing you know what what Joanne was talking about in terms of genetic findings. I think for a while there was this notion in in you know in genetics um, that the gene dominated, right, and it was really about identifying that gene and then watching that gene. Uh, take over and do its work. And in many cases, most folks would talk about the gene environment interaction. Similarly for us, we're talking about the intervention context interaction. And I think when we can line up some of those shared examples, whether it's with policymakers or other researchers, uh, you know, or other key folks within our ecosystem, then it makes it a lot easier to try and have that harmony of, of, of what can we do together. Um, and so the policy, you know, there's there's just a lot to it, and and it's an exciting area for um, for us to do more in. Mm, mm, I totally agree. There's a, a related set of questions that I'll pose to both of you, um, which is, you know, um, and I think this is another way possibly that awareness or interest can be raised, and that is when we're systematically understanding what the barriers are, mm -hmm. and using those barriers to design strategies mm -hmm. to get better. Um, implementation, if you like, whether that be behavioral, behavioral or system or, and there's a few questions related to, in your experience, 
you know, what, what have been either through your own research or through your knowledge of the research in general, or just through your practical experience, the actual barriers that have been observed around um, prevention medicine and disease prevention. So it goes back to what you were talking before, Joanne, around prevention and that not being kind of touched enough. And there's a series of questions where everyone's sort of saying, look, you know, what are the barriers? Is there some evidence about how we could overcome it? Um, so, Joanne, you want to start? Yeah, I can. I can hear your. I can see your brain going. Oh, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> so, I, I, okay. So, on on the one hand, um, when I got home, um, and when we, so I came back uh, in 2015 after getting trained in genomic medicine to try and implement it, and I think. Um, it was very instructive in that first few months where everyone says, oh, we need local data, we need local evidence. And, and so, okay, we said, okay, fine. So we spent two to three years mapping up what the barriers, did a whole bunch of um, mixed method studies, look at barriers and facilitators and everything. So I would say that, yes, there are unique challenges that are uh, uh, unique to Singapore culturally, socially, and the rest of it. But some of the barriers and facilitators aren't, are common everywhere, right? Are common across the globe. And so sometimes I don't necessarily feel we need to always redefine the problem again and again, every single time, but we can start with what the common problems, start implementing on that first, and then work through some of the more unique cultural aspects of it as well. So I would say, um, I, I, I do get a little bit frustrated whenever people say, oh, we need another study in Singapore, you know? And, and I'm like, so, so <laughs> like cost effectiveness studies, there's one in every state in Germany, for example, that's being done, right? And, and I'm like, do we really need to put that resources into that? So, um, so these are some of the, a little bit of the bugbears that I have, but of course the common barriers would be cost of screening, um, making it easy for people to actually do it, um, you know, having them have a plan. And I think in the Singapore context, I would say that the Health Promotion Board has really done a very, very good job in the last, um, I would say last 10 years. I, I really give a shout out to the Health Promotion Board because they've started a Screen for Life program where it's clearly, it's very nicely messaged um, you know, at what age, what's the general screening guidelines for everybody. It's very nice graphic. Um, it's very made very affordable um, for folks. Um, and it's a bit of a means testing kind of pricing into it as well. So you may pay nothing to $5 to just get the whole spectrum of screening. So I would say um, that's really addressing a big barrier. Now then, of course, what needs to happen is to see after the implementation of Screen for Life, um, what what has actually really where are the groups now that we need to intervene further on who are actually despite that not having that so I would say um, uh, the 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 common barriers like cost that that address common barriers of knowledge and awareness that address then we then need to know you know into subgroups what are the other kind of barriers so I would say um, that uh, uh, I I'm an impatient uh, academic. <laughs> I, so that's one of the reasons why when the earlier question was posed about do we wait to think everything's perfect before we implement, I'm, I'm, I, I would have to admit my bias isn't, isn't for that. My bias is really you, 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 some things you know uh, and you, you know, the evidence is very, very clear. You implement what's common and then, and then you dive into the, into the more itty bitty parts of it. Yep. I got that from you, Joanne, within about two minutes of meeting you. That is something for sure that you make very clear. It's very energizing. David, please go ahead. Um, so, so I think in addition to Joanne's great comments, I mean, certainly in terms of costs and, and in the challenge of the sort of the, the, the perfect being the enemy of the good kind of thing, I think for us, in, 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 and if you go beyond prevention within a particular uh, specialty, I think we have a true challenge of universal prevention doesn't necessarily have a single champion. And the challenge, at least that we see often, is that it cuts across different sectors of our environment around, uh, you know, across our uh, economy. Uh, and so it makes it hard when you can argue that it's relevant to so many, but owned by none. Hmm. is I think one of the main challenges that we see. And so when it, when often at least, you know, healthcare or, or medicine is sort of 
organ by organ or you know as part, we're all we're all composed of these individual parts that get looked at in isolation it becomes harder at least in some of our systems to have more of that holistic how do we do better for all and it's also really hard to demonstrate in the same way that you could show cure it's really hard to demonstrate that the absence of something is in, is 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 valuable oh, yeah. for many, and so I think that's something that makes it hard. It makes it frustrating. It makes it easier when we can draw that more direct causal link. Mm. Colorectal cancer screening, being able to have either early detection of polyps before they turn cancerous, or to give somebody a good confidence that they're likely to be clear for a while, is an easier argument to make than to say that diet, physical activity, nutrition may have a you know whole range of different benefits, but they're hard to see, particularly in that short-term policy context, or even in the short-term horizon that people make decisions around. So that, those are other barriers, I think. Okay, good. we're going to look to the future then. So in the in the last part, portion of the uh, webinar that we have, and there's two parts to this question. You can take it either which way, and there's a few questions emerging in the Q&A that are along the same. But where are we going with behavioral implementation science? What are the emerging opportunities? What are the hot topics? How do we apply it to improve our health and social care systems in the next 10 years? I mean, just wh where is the future taking us with this? And where should Busy as a, as a group at NUS and Singapore be um, participating and supporting that? And it's a real big... Now, David, I know you've written about this and I've seen you talk about it, so I'm going to have you go last because I want to hear from Joanne and then I want to hear David's sort of take on that. So I kind of think it's related to one of the questions in the in the in the chat about how uh, how do you get policymakers to de-implement? We're getting overwhelmed. So I really think that's going to be the biggest challenge in healthcare for for a long time is the to dealing with burnout and moral injury and that that side that side of things. How do we care better for ourselves as 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 clinicians? How do we care for our allied health um, nurses and the rest of it, you know, in, in the context of all this implementation that we want to do. And I, so I would say that would be one, I don't have easy solutions here, but, but I would, I would, I would say that one of the things that keep people not burning out is if it's not really so much the workload, but more being able to see the change that they're making in, in the system and being able to implement some of those changes. So I think we need to use BI kind of, so behavioral kind of, um, insight in that regard and how do we how do we form teams that do that how do we um without adding all more to committees and and, and teamwork because i can just see all my local colleagues going oh but then that would just mean a lot more meetings and the rest of it so i would say i would say one thing that we should work together on is is, is burnout i think that's really a big issue globally as well as locally um in the singapore context i think the next thing would be um the fact that we're all like i think there was a stanford paper that said that up to 50% of Americans born this year or next year or whatever will be living up to 100, right? And and so the whole entire, um, you know, the life, healthy longevity kind of discussion um, is going to therefore be very central to how we, it's going to be completely different how we engage our patients going forward with that lens. So I would say that those are the two, if I were to pick two areas or two areas that I would yeah, I would think that it's worthwhile working towards uh, finding answers. Yeah, terrific, David. Yeah, so so I I I, I love those uh, I love those answers. So so uh, count me in uh, for those uh, as well. <laughs> I, I think when 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 I try and at least speculate on, on where we've been and where we're going, I, I think the main thing that's both daunting and an opportunity is that we are shifting, we are actively shifting to a recognition that this world, our systems, our communities, there's so much dynamism 
And so this idea that we had started out with decades ago, that we create this bolus of knowledge and then it's about translation or it's about application um, and that we can predict what's going to happen has been clearly put to rest over the last couple of years and, and well before that. And so for me, the exciting opportunities are related to the ongoing learning that we need to do, that our interventions aren't static, but it's really how we understand how they're tailored and how they evolve over time that's going to be incredibly useful. In some cases, those evolutions may be positive and in some cases, not so much. And that's where de-implementation comes in, which is another thing that we didn't really think about. We really focused more on just doing something and can we get anybody to do what we think might be effective. Sustainability and really thinking about how do some of our innovations that continue to have value, uh, how can they continue to be delivered? And given burnout, given all of the challenges of trying to keep good things going, we need to shine more of a spotlight on that. I think the other thing that is really important going forward is that we move beyond this mentality of the intervention by itself. Mm -hmm is going to solve our problems and really thinking about how do we bundle into much better systems of care? How do we not assume that our challenge is getting that initial screen done and hoping that the system takes care of everything that follows, but really thinking about those broader care processes, the bundles of interventions that I don't think we always do so wonderfully at. And so it's the dynamism and it's also the sort of aggregated effect of doing better for more. So th those kind of things I think are really exciting. Well, then in that case, that implies, and it also goes to your comment, Joanne, around teams and some of your colleagues possibly on this going, are you going to make me do more meetings? Like, what's happening with this? You know, as we all know, and I have said a thousand times, and I'm repeating myself, implementation is a team sport. We do need to, um, it's, we can't do anything without collaboration and working across various stakeholders. And there's, again, a number of questions, particularly related to policymakers on the chat and in the Q&A. And I think given all of this sort of exciting motivational information we've been sharing. Let, let's finish by just thinking about how on earth are we going to engage the stakeholders that we need to engage to do this? Where have you done that well? There's some particular questions around policymakers, as I said. So just take us out with some inspirational, just how, how are we going to do this with the groups of people we need to do it with? Joanne, you get the last comment because you're going to, you're the, you're the local. David goes, can go first and then you get the, final say, Joanne, which I think is totally appropriate. Absolutely. As do I. Um, so I think because <laughs> whatever I can tee up will be immediately forgotten uh, with Joanne's <laughs> brilliance. Which is awesome. Um, so, so, so I think, you know, what to me and, and, you know, learning from others who've really focused on policymakers and policy implementation, I think it's, uh, you know, we, we often learn from stories. We learn from the tangible things that people are experiencing. And certainly policymakers that we see around us are motivated by the constituents that they are representing. And so I think we have an opportunity to build in a, a really wonderful set of cases about how implementation science and behavioral science, behavioral interventions uh, have improved people's lives, what we've learned, not just individuals, but communities, how we can put a face on what could seem like a lot of jargon uh, and these kind of confusing long-term processes toward trying to see some good quality indicator. I think all that pales in comparison of being able to say, how did this make a difference for people that you care about? Uh, for us in the U.S., it's often our, our uh, policymakers are motivated by family members who are struggling with cancer, who are struggling with other, or themselves in their own journey. Uh, and so I do think it's about uh, pulling together, you know, it's entertaining the questions that everybody has for us and being willing to take the time to think about them and provide answers. But I think it's also about the stories uh, that we can provide to, to, to put the face that, that needs to be on all of this. So 
I think I, I would really ag- totally agree with David there about the the importance of um, patient public narrative. Um, and and I think when it comes to policy, public narrative really, really matters. And that's one area where I think the Singapore context um, is it, certainly something we don't use all we we don't we don't um, engage with as often and and in in my journey with what I do and everywhere I go, uh, especially in Europe, everyone said you know oh these are the things that the patients ask for the public ask for they are the ones who go lobby for this you know not really the clinicians right and so I think that's one area where we need to sort of get better at in terms of getting the public narrative um, uh, uh, piece. Uh, done well and done appropriately. I think that's one one aspect. Um, the other thing I would say is more learning and sharing of things that worked mm-hmm. or didn't work. Will will through webinars like this would really um, kind of be be an impetus for for more change and the rest of it. So I think I think learning from one another um, is the other. I think the last one that. I would kind of say, but it just fell out of my head right now. <laughs> As oh. I was, was it, it was the most important one. I kept it last, but but um, oh yes, that's right. <laughs> so I'm in an exper- I'm in an experiment right now. Um, I, I, I will share this experiment. This experiment is led by Dr. Tai Yishong from NUS, uh, who leads the Precise program. Um, it's basically aimed at helping all of us who want to make precision medicine a reality, um, uh, streamlining it a little bit. So in this, ex- I call it an experiment. Um, in this experiment, all the challenges that I'm facing. Uh, it's also faced by my colleague in uh, uh, kidney dis- uh, in ne- nephrology. It's also faced by my colleague in cardiology. It's also faced by my colleagues in neurology. So is there is that is it possible for us to therefore rather than each of us doing it on our own, uh, engage with stakeholders as as a group, and then to get you know that uniform set of outcome measures that we would need, and then and then and then move on from there. So. I'm in. I'm in this experiment. It's going well so far. Um, we've. We've. It's very collegial. We've. We've met with our stakeholders who've responded as well. And and I, I'm just holding out my breath as to whether that does that equal at the end of the day implementation. I will let you know in maybe three years time. Right. Oh. But, but this would be an effort in trying to um, not have not make it as laborious as it would have otherwise been if we each went and did it, uh, you know, both for ourselves as well as for policymakers, right? And is to try and do this as a group, as a collective, and and, and see whether we can get that done. So I, I won't know. Uh, I'll let you know in three years whether we've succeeded. It's, it's okay. an experiment. Yeah. Okay. Good luck with that. All right. <laughs> well, listen, thank you both very, very much for agreeing to do this. Uh, And David, I'm aware it it is getting late. And I was hoping you had a bourbon or something in your hand. That would have been totally appropriate. I forgot to prompt it. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But thank you again. Thank you to participants. Thank you for the questions. Um, We collect them and we do a little bit of a follow-up. You can see some of the articles we discussed. And there's actually a local article around COVID that has been posted in the chat. Joanne, David, you're a terrific um, busy. We'll stay involved with you, of course, and um, the rest of you have a very good day.